Okay, well, a very good uh, evening and uh, welcome to everyone here at the uh, Dover Amateur Radio Club. My name is John Hudson and I'm here tonight with Mike KD2KOG and Steve uh, KI5EMW to give an update on SDR, SDR Play specifically, talk about our products and software and then uh, move on to make it interactive, answer questions, and uh, hopefully it'll be a, a nice uh, entertaining evening. I'm gonna talk for, it might be 40 minutes or so, just uh, going through some of the basics. Um, so apologies to those who are already very familiar with uh, SDRs and RSPs, but um, even there, there may be some new things to see. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and, um, We'll get uh, we'll get started. Okay. Okay. So, if for any reason there's a problem, just uh, unmute and shout. <laughs> I don't mind being interrupted, but um, I'd much rather you said something than let me carry on if you can't hear me or uh, understand what's going on. So a little bit about the background of the company, and then we'll move into the, the products, the software, and um, some of the capabilities that uh, are offered by the RSP family. SDR Play, it's a British company. It's uh, seven and a half years old, um, almost eight years now. Um, it's quite a small company. It's a joint venture that's uh, come together um, with thanks to the help of UK chip company Mirix. And Mirix, um, quite a small uh, company, just before we got together, had had some success developing SDR chips for the PC and cellular industry. I don't know if you could remember, but you go back about 10 years, it looked very much like cell phones, uh, mobile phones were going to have more and more um, broadcast reception capability. Um, I mean, if you go back a bit further in Japan, you had people uh, commuting to work, watching terrestrial TV on their high-end phones. So this is really before the smartphone and Apple and Samsung kind of set the scene on, on the whole thing. It's before uh, the availability of hotspots and 4G, 5G, uh, higher bandwidths became possible, it did look like for a while people would want to um, receive broadcast signals. It's not really in the interests of the um, <clears throat> of the food chain, if you like, so obviously it didn't take off. But Mirix had developed this fantastic uh, technology to cope with the typical environment where you have a very powerful processor at the heart of, of uh, a phone or, or a computer, and uh, also quite a hostile environment in the case of the phone where uh, signals are weak, um, your proximity to interferers would be horrendous, antennas are almost non-existent. So they developed some pretty cool chip technology, SDR technology, that ultimately would allow anything from like long wave up to L band, which is why it's bounded by the two gigahertz top limit. It was really engineered initially for what would have been um, a bigger market. But then a lot of amateur people were noticing that some of the cheaper dongles and lower performance dongles could be used in this SDR receive mode and encouraged uh, some of the original founders of Mirix. And I got involved from uh, my background in semiconductors at CSR and Texas Instruments before. And with my ham radio background, uh, we came together and the first RSP was born. We are still relatively small. We have kind of seven full-time employees and a few others who subcontract to us. Um, but the major efforts of creating the radio is, is all uh, subcontracted. Uh, and we do manufacture in the UK, in both Hartlepool and Peterborough. Uh, we have registered offices in um, Hampshire. So we're kind of a true UK company, which is quite unusual these days when it comes to um, radio hardware in general. Okay, so 
again, apologies if this is a bit uh, basic, but for those who might be just tuning in for the first time, wondering what is SDR, it really is um, a software defined radio is a communication system where the components that were traditionally implemented in hardware, so that's things like mixers, filters, amplifiers, modulators, and so on, are implemented by software on a PC or embedded system, some kind of computer. And this uh, block diagram just indicates the kind of architectures that we employ. This is our simplest design, the RSP1A. Um, the other products I'll come on to have additional features, but the, at the basis of all our RSPs is when it comes to the hardware, um, a focus on some front end. Here's the antenna over on the left. Um, we go. Uh, we add in some broadcast filters to remove the most likely interfering signals that would cause problems. And any of you who've played with sort of the lower cost dongles that don't have these kind of filters will find medium wave, FM in Europe, DAB uh, transmissions, um, which are typically very, very strong, can create all sorts of um, unwanted mixing products and other interfering signals causing trouble for a wideband SDR like this. So we have these switchable filters that can be switched in. Um, the natural sort of gain stages and hardware amplification prior to then having a bank of uh, quite advanced uh, filters to limit the um, region which is open to the downstream processing. Because if you're in, say, under two megahertz, you really don't want the signals above that uh, to be uh, doing anything at all. Um, so we have this bank of uh, filters, and then we have the tuner circuitry. And then out of the tuner, we have the analog to digital conversion, which then sends the um, phase and quadrature signals um, over the USB connection to the computer. And from then on, all the heavy lifting is done by software. And a, probably the biggest difference between a traditional hardware receiver and uh, an SDR is the fact you can visualize the spectrum. And here's just a screenshot showing the typical uh, SDR Uno uh, uh, display where at the center stage here, you have the spectrum uh, scope, if you like, or the spectrum display, uh, where you can actually see all the signals. So this offers the possibility to um, literally kind of click and pounce on a particular signal, rather than having to constantly spin the dial and uh, maybe miss something that's popped up while you're already listening to a station of interest. Um, We'll talk a bit more about pan adapters, which is a typical use of these products to uh, tie to the um, transceiver frequency that your main rig may be using. So in our product range at the moment, we have these three, um, I don't know if I can move that. We have these three, um, three products, the RSP1A, which I mentioned, we have the RSPDX and the Duo, which I'll come on to. And the whole thing is glued together by our SDR Uno Windows-based software. <clears throat> Let me um, hide that. So the RSP1A, um, the key thing it offers is clean one kilohertz to two gigahertz coverage so general coverage receiver capability and the ability to ability to see up to 10 megahertz of visible spectrum. So it's got the all round functionality. It's got a single antenna, antenna port, uh, the multiple front end fil filters and notch filters I mentioned. All our products come with the free Windows software SDR Uno. Uh, but there's some other interesting third party software that's um, particularly useful. For example, um, because we have calibrated uh, power measurement built into the um, and, and special gain tables available for all our products, 
we have some third party software from an Australian guy, Steve Andrew, who developed the uh, spectrum analyzer software, uh, which is um, means that you can use your any of these RSPs as, as, a, as a lab instrument with calibrated um, RF power measurement. Um, some of the more the sort of educational world and some developers um, enjoy using GNU radio and there are source blocks available again from third parties for that. Um, there's increasing interest around Raspberry Pi, particularly uh, after the 3B came out and then the 4 and we provide an SD card image for um, operation using some software that runs on a Raspberry Pi. We'll come on to that. And as I say, you've got all you need for uh, a pan adapter. And it's proved a really nice um, sort of gift value type of product for attracting a lot of lapsed hams, you know, my age and even older, uh, to get back into ham radio, um, as well as youngsters to, uh, to explore uh, a true radio again. Here, this graph just, or this picture just shows an example of the uh, accurate power measurement that, uh, that comes with the RSPs. And within SDR Uno, you can actually do data logging. So you can set a time interval. So every second or everything up to every 1800 seconds, I think you can take a measurement and log the data into a CSV format for charting and uh, you know further post process processing so again this is this is cool if you're trying to sort of plot um uh you know uh, interfering signals uh, go after emc problems or indeed uh just uh, look at your own sort of polar diagram uh, at a safe distance from your own transmitter this is a screenshot of the spectrum analyzer function that i mentioned so that's, uh, that stuff works with all the RSPs. Let's move up to the RSP DX. And some, this was a redesign of what was a very popular device, the RSP2, um, RSP2 Pro, which we launched um, four years ago. We um, then did a, a complete redesign, probably learning along the way, improving the performance. And this part has, a, a, just like the RSP1A, the same spectrum coverage. But in this case, you have three software selectable antenna ports, which means you can have uh, multiple antennas connected simultaneously. And then you can kind of spin the dial from long wave to microwaves and still uh, without having to go to disconnect and reconnect uh, antennas. So that's proved very popular. We've got enhanced HF performance um, versus the prior RSP2. And we've also got below two megahertz, this um, HDR mode, which combined with the additional filtering that we have, um, both in hardware and software, just allows uh, a more rugged approach to uh, medium wave and below for those uh, DXs interested in that. There's also, you know, this amateur experimental bands down there at LF. Uh, we also have a external clock input, so you can tie it to a G GPS disciplined oscillator should you want to. And um, it comes in a more, um, a very nice rugged black painted steel case. So that's the RSP DX. And then top of the range is the Duo, which has everything I've mentioned so far. Um, although it doesn't have the extra uh, medium wave HDR mode. That's the only thing that's missing, really. Um, but what it does have, which is extremely useful, is the ability to switch either between the 10 megahertz visibility anywhere from one kilohertz up to two gigahertz, or you can separately, simultaneously look at two separate two megahertz chunks of the spectrum. So this could be down at um, HF and this could be up at uh, UHF. Uh, some of the plane spotting people like to uh, have one of these doing ADSB decode of the tele telemetry information at the same time as 
uh, listening to the VHF air traffic control. So this is uh, very powerful. And there are other advantages as well with the dual tuner. Um, because you can actually simultaneously process the signals from two antennas. And um, this has uh, not only um, the ability to do some diversity and noise reduction, um, because we've made sure there's some phase coherence between these two tuners, but it also allows you to do real-time antenna comparisons. I don't know how many of you've you know, tried to you know, you go on 20 meters and uh, everything looks pretty good with one antenna. And then you, by the time you put the other one on, you know, the other one seems pretty good, but you never really know the fading conditions that are so pre prevalent on HF. You can't really get that kind of real time feeling apples for apples with um, identical um, receive characteristics. So, uh, this was something we didn't realize, but we've heard more and more is very, very popular use of the RSP Duo, real-time antenna comparisons. Okay. So I think we've covered all that with the Duo. So you can monitor the wide band, widely spaced bands. We have the diversity demodulation, and I'll show a bit about what's possible there in relation to the signal enhancement and noise cancelling capability and then real-time antenna comparisons. So here's a screenshot showing the RSP Duo um, as it can be automatically configured for your for your computer and display and you'll see basically there's a top half and a bottom half which look pretty identical. So you have all the receiver controls for tuner one at the top here and in this case tuner two at the bottom uh, right below it, that's showing two widely spaced bands, but you could equally have them tuned to the same signal and see the exact uh, power levels of the incoming signals that you're comparing. So a few pictures of some of the examples I mentioned. So this is air traffic control at the same time as uh, ADSB for aircraft uh, activities. And here is... Um, diversity tuning. When you, um, in SDR Uno, with an RSP Duo, initialize the, or call for the diversity tuning, you get this um, uh, by basically clicking on this button here to turn into diversity mode, you get this little rosette appears, which gives a phase and amplitude. Uh, the, the length of this line is the uh, relative amplitude of tuner one to tuner two and you can modify the relative strengths of the two signals and by rotating it you can uh, shift the uh, phase uh, the way in which the two phases are added together and this is great because you can actually it's called maximum ratio combinations for signal enhancement and effectively doing the opposite you can subtract unwanted signals from the wanted signal if you have two antennas um spatially you know separated then you can actually get some pretty good uh, interference rejection and again on um on youtube there's some great uh, demonstrations showing that uh, so that's uh, another benefit of the of the dual tuner and here we are comparing uh, antennas in real time and uh, one of our videos vid548 is a nice demo of, uh, of that capability. Um, you'll find uh, this on the web, and also I'll make these slides available um, in a link after the talk. Um, but obviously, if you're trying to decide which RSP makes most sense for you, then some of the key specifications are listed here. And over on the right here, you can see um, which capability is offered by which uh, which of the three RSPs? So that's uh, that's on the hardware front. Um, just to say a little bit now about the software, and it might be interesting just to take a couple of minutes here and just um, actually give a demonstration of SDR Uno in action. So. If, I, if the screen goes blank, something's gone wrong, but we'll we'll do our best here. 
<clears throat> While you're doing that, John, I'm still trying to get my head around the concept of a lapsed ham. Sounds like the little pig that got left behind. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> well, that's true. A lot of people, I mean, long before the internet, they got interested in electronics and technology from playing ham radio or being shortwave listeners and then they go off and do their thing and then they you know forget all about it life does whatever it does to them and then you get a bit older and um you know it's a great hobby to return to um so right this is sdr uno oh, i've got it here on the 20 meter band i'm using an rspdx in this demo and Kilowatt echo. Italy, Victoria 3. Oh, kilo echo calling 20 meters. Standing by. Always Italians. <laughs> just come in the shack. Don't have the amplifier on. Just, uh, just running about 100 watts. Go ahead. That sounded like a W, US. But as you can see, it's lit because it's obviously upper side band. If you move the uh, cursor to the left hand side of the signal, yeah. some French there for our French gentleman on the call. Oh, it's finished. It's finished. oh sorry, I'm so sorry. Anyway, this is SDR Uno in action and um thank you. I'll just stop it for now. Hey John, um, uh, yeah. would that be a, a good time to mention what you can glean by looking at the uh, the signals that appear in the waterfall? It's very obvious which ones are voice transmissions. And then you moved your cursor over to the left. It looked like you were on some FT8 stuff going on down there about 14 oh, yes. point. Uh, stuff. Yeah. That's the FT8. Can you hear it? Yeah. And, uh, and then, you, of course, you can here. See, you can see those long straight lines with the typical digital modes like FT8. Um, you don't seem to have much CW going on, but further to the left at the bottom end of the band, you can actually see dots and dashes appearing in the waterfall. So it, not only can you see where the signals are, you can tell at a glance what type of signal it is. Now, what I don't know is that one up there about 14.245. Uh, what uh, go up a bit? Yeah, what's that next one that's got that real thick? Yeah, it's Italy, Italy 3, whiskey radio. It's an Italian. Radio. No, that's the other one, a little bit further. That's USB, go to the right. It's not now. Yeah, it's gone, oh. Steve, it's gone. It's gone. 14, 14, 245. 245. 245? Yeah, he's... Right, there's another one there now. 14, 245 is going to be voice. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I better not spend too long on this. As you can see here in the south, in sort of central England, the, the signals come in romping from Italy and uh, Spain. Uh, that was 20 really meters at the moment. So that's good stuff. Right. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll return to the here and um get through this so we can do some uh, some questions in a minute ah slideshow there we are um so that that's a demonstration of the sdi uno software which uh, runs on windows and um the, the basic layout of it is the uh the, the main control panel the receiver display with these band buttons, which are all presets, and then the uh, the spectrum display. So we develop, and uh, I guess it's our intellectual property we've developed, 
having taken over some software called Studio One um, from an Italian developer four years ago, we've taken it and kind of enhanced it specifically to optimize for our RSP family. And um, the great thing is when you buy an RSP, um, you then get in uh, subsequent uh, updates, additional features that uh, that come along. So there are people who, who bought an RSP um, one, you know, many years ago, and then suddenly along comes the scanning features and uh, a lot more besides. So as well as providing the SDR Uno software, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment in terms of the, the plans to migrate it to other platforms. At the moment, it's Windows only. Uh, but we do provide multi-platform support for other platforms like Mac, Linux, Android, Raspberry Pi. And uh, obviously, we do as much as we can um, to, to support popular third-party software like SDR Console, HDSDR, and Cubic SDR, which is uh, one of the products that runs natively on a variety of other platforms. In the last year, we've seen this uh, new software SDR++, which is getting a lot of attention, which is fully supported um, for our products. And that, that runs natively on the Mac and other platforms like Raspberry Pi. Slightly more esoteric, but popular, uh, driven by the Hermes program is Spark SDR, which um, is uh, in the next uh, week or so, we'll have a release of software that supports the RSPs. Uh, as well as the mainstream SDR software, um, we're always trying to support or help people who do support other third-party um, software that goes alongside ours. So this is data loggers, other decoders, the rig control software that we um, touched on earlier. In terms of the roadmap for SDR Uno, um, the big one coming, which is still, still a way off, is to take SDR Uno and make it cross-platform. The work has actually been going on for over a year, it's, uh, but it can't be released till it all comes together. And this will support both the x86 and the new Mac M1 architecture, if at all possible. I think that's looking fairly positive now. There's a new remote server, which is gonna be really cool so that um, you can truly do everything you can do on SDR Uno, um, but remotely from having your, your RSP um, on, a, on a server at a you know, very low noise environment, as long as you've got an internet connection. So more on that in the coming months. And these are the facilities and features here. Before version two, we have one final version of the current uh, Windows software to get out there. And again, this is adding improvements and requests that we've had from the user community. So this is just uh, memory panel updates, some updates to the scanner, some useful custom controls. Um, and um, I mentioned band framing, which is the ability to just press on at 80 meters and have the software set up to exactly span the, say the 80 meters, 3.5 to four megs. Um, you'll be able to, you know, if you're not in America, you don't really want to see the whole 500 kilohertz. You only want 3.5 to 3.8. So you'll be able to customize your own bands um, for where you are. And we'll be adding some startup tips to just make it easier for newcomers to get going. Um, so a few final comments. Um, obviously, there's a lot more you can do with a general purpose wideband SDR, as well as all the stuff of interest to the amateur radio community. There's uh, a lot of other exciting things you can do in terms of tuning into other signals, um, downloading and processing some really nice satellite imagery, weather faxes and, and that kind of thing. And then those of you who are involved in um, wireless technology uh, commercially, there's some great industrial applications, as well as for the educational scientific community. 
this is just a screenshot of our homepage from our website, which we um, we're always trying to sort of make it as easy to use as possible. So on here, you'll see that we've got uh, the most uh, the most needed things down here as big buttons you can press on in terms of finding out more, obviously where to buy it, um, and then getting the software you need and help. So those are the very important, uh, particularly this help button. And then in, down here, if you click on miscellaneous, you get all the other uh, support pages that we provide. So this is uh, everything from Mike's uh, very personalized ham guides uh, channel and uh, a, a direct route to him for uh, suggestions for more videos or or help that doesn't fit into the sort of one-to-one uh, uh, -one type of help. We've got antenna suggestions. You get our blog. Uh, community links is pro probably one of the most important ones, to which I'll show some uh, examples of that in a minute. We've got our library of documentation and videos, our kind of uh, support catalog of of uh, materials to help on that, as well as uh, the other things you can read there. Um, a growing part of our capability is the plugins, which we launched uh, over a year ago now, but already we're starting to see some very nice ready-made add-on software specifically for SDR Uno. And we can talk about that if people have questions in a while. So this is the, uh, if you click on software, you get a, a screen like this. If you're new, you just can click on start here, um, or you can dive straight in and select your model and the operating system. And then you'll be guided through to um, the, uh, uh, the combination you need to, for installation. And then if you need help, the help button will take you to um, technical help. And, you know, we do prompt with some frequently uh, uh, requested or frequently asked questions that we have answers to. Um, but obviously, if you don't get your answer, it's only another screen to uh, click on the button here that says, do you still need help? Click here and you could raise a ticket. And we have a rigorous ticket system whereby no ticket is left unanswered. Um, you know, if it goes 24 hours, that really is... Um, unusual it often gets uh, answered within uh, hours because uh, we have coverage both here in uh, the uk and in the us so we're covering about half the globe uh, during sort of working hours if you like and we work weekends as well so there's a lot of a lot of help there and um, i mentioned the community channel button which will have links to all the um uh Oh, sorry. This is the applications and video guides. So we've got we've got a YouTube channel which is uh, just growing and growing, and then we've got the applications and support catalog that I mentioned. The community uh, support we have. We've got um, a very active Facebook group, seventeen thousand members, and you can pop a question on there, and within minutes, someone's come back with. Uh, helpful replies. I mean, it really is, is great. It's just such a friendly environment. We occasionally get, you know, little squ squabbles, but, you know, to be honest, compared with what I see in many other hobby uh, forums, this is a, a just such a friendly place to get help from people who are probably doing exactly what you're trying to do in terms of hardware, software combinations, or application interests. There are, for those who hate Facebook, um, there's also an IO groups IO group which is uh, growing and um, uh, that's that's pretty good as well as uh, as a more traditional forum. Um, purchasing you can buy direct from us or I should give a shout out to Martin Lynch I think who's um, uh, known to quite a few people down there at Dover, um, but uh, in the UK all the um, serious main ham radio uh, resellers are uh, typically supported either directly from us or from one of our channel partners. Um, we're always warning people about fakes because as with everything, um, there's an awful lot of uh, fake products out there. Um, this can be anything from people 
putting something which is the weight of a RSP in a jiffy bag, sending it on the slowest way possible um, so that by the time you get it and find it's uh, a molten bar of chocolates or something, uh, they've gone off with your money and they've disappeared. Um, as a general rule, I would just, for, for our products, I wouldn't say this is true of all products, but for our products, just to avoid AliExpress and Banggood, no proper resellers that of SDR Play use AliExpress or Banggood. Um, but there's more on the website that uh, warns you about, um, about fakes. We've got examples there. Um, and, you know, it, it's just a bit of a, a bit of a problem but it's it, i think we all suffer from this so just uh, buyer beware make sure you're buying from someone you trust uh, that's the key message there okay well look i've used my 40 minutes this is the kind of uh, just give an intro but what i'd like to do now is really turn it over to uh, to you you guys and girls to uh, ask questions and see if we can help as i say we're very Sad that Andy couldn't be with you. Andy is our software architect, and many of you know him. He's a, a great speaker. He's got uh, a lot of um, in-depth understanding around the software issues. But to make up for it, instead of one Andy, you've got three of us. There's me, there's Steve in Dallas, there's Mike in Florida, and we'll do our best to, uh, to answer uh, any questions. And the three of us still only know half as much as Andy. Yes. <laughs> Steve, can I just start with a can I just start with a, a question, please? Um, the question is um, what we were talking about before we started the recording with the uh, ICOM seventy six ten. So, yeah. if you could just explain what you were saying to to make sure I've got it right. So you're saying use the MFJ. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily, mate. Um, okay. There's a number of things. I, what I'd like to reference uh, you to, and Mike is good at this. He may dig it up for me. I okay. did a webinar. John mentioned webinars earlier on. I did one just on pan adapters some time right. ago. And you can watch the video, and there's also a PDF of all the slides I showed. Okay. Um, there's, there's two things you need to worry about when you're building a pan adapter, right? Right. The first one is how do you get the RF signals into the RSP in a safe fashion so that when you transmit, you don't blow the thing up? Yeah. And me not being the technical guy, I just tell everybody because RSPs run on smoke, if you mm -hmm. transmit into them, the smoke escapes and then they don't work <laughs> anymore, right? But the, the, the key thing is, I mean, seriously, you like any sensitive receiver, you've got to be careful that uh, it's protected when you transmit. Yeah. And there's two ways to do this. Uh, all of them involve using a TR, which is a transmit receive switch. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the MFJ 1708 B SDR. And I'd like to give a shout out to the folks at, at MFJ because when we got into this business, um, we found users were modifying the existing switch they had to make it well suited to this application. So we kind of documented what would be the perfect TR switch and we send it to MFJ and said, uh, hey, you know, can you do something like this? Well, two weeks later, a little box appeared in my mailbox. And he said, is this what you want? And that was the wow. MFJ 1708 B-SDR. Yeah, so yeah. that will work with any rig, OK? And, and what it does is it um, takes the signal from your antenna. And when you're in receive mode, it splits that signal two ways. One, one side goes into your regular rig. And the other side goes into the RSP yeah. through a, a nice little matching network, actually. But then when you go to transmit, what it does is it disconnects the RSP and grounds its input. And at the same time, it sends the full signal from your transceiver straight out to the antenna. OK, so yeah. that's that's how it achieves the protection. Now, in the case of your ICOM 7610, there is uh, some jacks on the back labeled RX antenna out and RX. RX antenna in and um, I believe on that particular rig it's intended to be used as a loop through for some extra filtering and stuff yeah but it is protected by an internal TR switch inside the rig right so if you have that sort of arrangement what you can do is you can take RX antenna out put it into a splitter 
send one leg back to RX antenna in so that you can still hear the receive channel yeah. on your rig. And then the other leg goes to the input on the RSP1 or RSP1A or DX yeah. or, or Duo, whatever. So that takes care of getting the signal into the RSP and having it protected. Perfect. And then the second part of, of building a pan adapter is to um, synchronize the rig and SDR Uno. And as John mentioned, I think we use OmniRig. And yes. um, it, it's very, the reason we use OmniRig, uh, apart from the fact that it came with Studio One, is OmniRig has a bunch of profiles for just about every rig that's been manufactured forever, you know? Mm. So it's very simple for us to interface to it. We just send frequency information to the rig and then OmniRig formats the commands in such a way that the rig will understand them. Mm -hmm. So in, in SDR Uno, you, well, you'd fire up uh, OmniRig, you tell it what kind of rig you've got, which physical COM port it's connected to on, on your PC, and uh, and click OK, and then you'll see in the Uno main window in the upper left, um, there's a settings button, and if you go to the O-Rig tab, it tells you yeah, uh, yeah. what your rig is. It should say connected to OmniRig server, and it should say rig status online, okay? And once you do that, if you hit the rig sync button at the top of your RX control window, anytime you change the frequency in SDR Uno, it will send that frequency change down to your rig. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you click on the spectrum where you see a signal, your rig will tune to that same signal. Yeah. Uh, okay. At the same time, if you turn the knob on the rig to tune manually, and, and what I tend to do is I tend to click on a signal, but because my coordination sucks, I'm never exactly on there. So then I turn the dial on the radio to fine tune it, okay? Mm -hmm. And yeah, as I yeah. turn the, the frequency dial on the on the rig, it changes the, the uh, frequency yeah, and SDR yeah. Uno to match. Yeah. So, you know, th th there are several different ways you can achieve that protection. We talked about, you know, using the loop through on your rig. Um, some rigs just have an RX antenna out function there all the time. Uh, the Kenwood uh, TS590SG, which I have here, is one example like that. And I think like the Yesu 5000 has it as well. Mm -hmm. But basically um there are many you know different radios and different signals available to you and in that webinar i tried to go through the pros and cons of each different method which will depend on a what you're trying to accomplish and b what signals are available on your rig okay uh, for example a lot of people like to use if out and i am a strong advocate of not using if out and I, briefly i'll tell you why it's because if you take the if out signal to sdr uno you can set up Uno to, re to respond to that. But at that point, what you're telling the RSP is, I'm going to tune you to that IF output frequency and never change. Okay. Wow. So what that means is you don't have the ability to go off and look at other bands while, while you're, you know, working one band on your rig. You can't go and look and see what the conditions are like on the other bands. Mm -hmm. And the maximum window you see is, is constrained by the IF bandwidth of your rig. Right. So some people are happy with that. Okay. Uh, personally, I think it's a terrible way to, to do it, but it can be done. Right. Okay. Um, I probably rabbited on too long for, for this particular meeting, but we can always explore this further out, outside this call, if you will. And did did Mike send you the link? Yes, he sent you the webinar. Uh, okay. He sent you the YouTube link and yeah. the uh, and the PDF in chat. So right. that yeah, covers thanks. everything I know about pan adapters over the Brilliant. last five years or whatever yeah cheers Steve. thanks mike you can make. brilliant thank you very much if there's anyone that has questions in their mic shy or video shy i'm typing away in chat so you guys are more than welcome to hammer me and chat with questions and i'll do my best to answer them yeah i don't really have a question but i'm i'm more on the wish list uh, for some reason i use the uh, uh, power and cnr uh, for real-time analysis, I use a GNU, GNU plotter uh, to plot the, the signal every every five seconds. My problem is that uh, with the SDR Uno, I don't know if on the uh, on the time, I only have the time, not the date, which 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 is a problem when you are analyzing more than one day or analyzing multiple days. Uh, if you look inside the inside the file, you only have the time, not yes, the day. We bug. have heard that before. Yeah. yeah, that has been 
and it's being raised. addressed. And I think it's I don't know when, but it's certainly yeah. And please don't out. use don't use verbal day or or, or months, but numeric. Number. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I, I see think that. that's because of the for French the next release. Yeah, because of the French and English uh, way of doing things, and also for the same reason, for the same functionality. I don't like to see uh, the lines uh, on the timeline uh, because sometimes I use it. Uh, I'm using one second uh, 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 time. What do you call that again? This is the time, time mark, base, the time, time mark interval? Time, yeah, the time yeah. mark interval. But it has to be there because if you untick it, it does not write into the file anymore. Right. Yeah, that's on more wish list. I know that. We're not supposed to do to talk about wish lists, but that's fine. I'm, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> promising anything, but we'll yeah, know I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I didn't know I that. Know. I thought when you when you changed the setting, it just took it off the display. I didn't realize it took it out of the file. No, if you if you that. yeah, if you untick it and you click on the button on the uh, on the Z, you know, automatically put the timelines, uh, you know, that time lines on the on, on the waterfall. And if you go back to the settings and you remove it, it is not right on the file anymore. Okay, well, yeah. interesting. We'll, yeah. we'll look into that. Yeah, yeah. For me, it, it's it's one of the things that annoy me uh, the most. I have to say because it's a great, really great programs. And another one, which is way, way, way beyond what you will do those next days but <laughs> yeah i know that but think big think big Go for yeah it. <laughs> i'm thinking big man but you know i like the api but i really like the restful because it's much more easier to work on it you know what it is restful uh, right? you you prefer what restful rest api oh rest rest api rest api because with a REST, yeah. REST API, you can you can control at least with a web page. This is yeah, awesome. the, um, that, that's know. something that we'll have to go to Andy. That's that's yeah. I know. I know. all three of us that I know of, and I, I, I don't know what would be involved with that. Uh, the only reason I know anything about REST APIs is from my home automation experiments. So we'll, yeah, we'll then, just have... then, then you know what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> which is something <laughs> yeah yeah it is something but yeah. why i'm why i'm saying that is because if you're using api you need to use c plus plus or one of those really difficult things to do even for me because i'm not a programmer i know how to how to use python or even java or well not yeah. really but yeah but if i have to go to c plus plus and install all of these things on my computer i just forget about it that's the problems with api and yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, because it's may, maybe because why we don't have that much of a of a, a, a plugin because people find it hard to do the C++. Yeah, plus, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. But if you take a look at the other software which I don't use, yeah, I use SDR Sharp, but along with uh, with uh, SDR, you know, for the. Uh, QPSK or something like this uh, for the for the for, you, for might, you might look into uh, SDR plus plus because that vi uh, visually at least looks very similar to to Sharp. Yeah, you know what, Steve? You know what? I don't want to learn another software. <laughs> this is you know, it's just you have that, that lear learning curve. It's it's quite long. Uh, I don't have that much of time to do that, and I, I believe that SDR you know is covering ninety nine percent of my needs. Yeah, and. For for the one person, I think I can find a solution. But yeah, I believe that we, we as they you know, deserve more plugins, more and more plugins. And it's maybe because it's maybe complicated to do it compared to some other software. Yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll get John to yeah. pass that, those comments. I'll on pass that on to Anthony. Yeah, and we'll uh, note noted that. Uh, I, I was also looking at, uh, at Ash's comments in chat about. Uh, uh, freezing the display and looking at the, I, I see Mike answered some of it, the, the, you know, the CPU specs and RAM and everything. I mean, that thing should blow and go regardless of whether you're in low IF or zero IF mode. So that's, that's kind of a mystery. Um, you know, be port uh, suspension, if it's after X amount of minutes, it could be the operating system putting the USB into suspension mode. Let me post the link. 
Yeah, it, it, could, it could be, but, but he's actually saying that uh, it doesn't happen in zero AF, only in low AF, which is weird. Yeah, it's very weird, but it could be so, something that's running in the background. It could be a, a, something that's oh, yeah, yeah. untimed, uh, but you could still, I mean, this is still good to, to run these these commands through. It won't cause any harm. Let me just find the link. No, 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 I think your comment there, you know, look at the bars in the main window mm -hmm. of Uno and, and look at whether it's the SDR CPU that's maxed out or, or the system uh bar that's maxed out and, oh, no. i mean my cpu is a, might be a little bit faster than his but generally like two three percent maybe five percent at most even at you yeah. know 10 megs of bandwidth well my mine is only an i5 and i only i think i've only got eight gig of ram so mm -hmm. I, i'm less spec than he has and i don't have those issues so um i i think what you said mike about going in and looking to task manager because mm -hmm. I've often noticed in Windows, it gets totally obsessed with Windows Update, and, and there are some processes that it runs. They get stuck. You know, but you don't know that it's Windows Update. You have to Google it and find out what it's all about. So I, I wonder what you think, Mike, because you've probably seen this more often than I have, is just trying a, a software reset in Uno, just in case there's something weird going on. Yeah, there's no harm done. I mean, you can save your, your workspace or just, I reset Uno nine times a day because i'm yeah. i live in that thing 12 hours a day well i'm always trying to see what it's like for the first you know the first user so i right. want to go back to three and a half megahertz and all that yeah. stuff you but can always try a reset you can try the the pdf if people aren't in chat i'm posting links as people like as john is mentioning things that go along with his chat or what steve's mentioning so i'm trying to keep up with the 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 meeting and to get all the you know the information as much as possible so guys definitely look in the the chat section I'm posting as many links in, as I can and answering to the best of my ability. But you're doing you're doing good, Mike. So for anyone <laughs> that doesn't know, uh, resetting the software involves going to the SDR Uno main panel, panel mm -hmm. clicking on the opt button for options, and then reset to factory defaults. Uh, if you do that, it it takes Uno back, um, you know, to where it started. You will lose any workspaces you've saved when you do that, but you won't lose memory banks or anything like that. And uh, sometimes if you get a bizarre situation, which is what Ash seems to have here, it may help. But I can guarantee you, Ash, your, your CPU specs are more than enough. That thing should blow and go. Um, and, and, you know, like you say, zero IF is potentially the highest bandwidth. Um, I guess the other thing to look at is make sure there's nothing else floating around on your uh, USB bus that might be using some bandwidth. We do like to use as much bandwidth as we can out of a USB uh, 2.0 host controller. I'm curious so, what the sysbar is showing, because that will tell a lot, because yeah. that's way before, before you even click play, the sysbar is going to show you what type, what type of, you know, what's, what's the CPU being hit at as a total. Yeah. Yeah, it's very low compared to the system usage okay. of the uh, CPU. But uh, I mean, okay. it's like it's less than a second freezes from time to time. I'd like when I, when I, and I use a Chrome or whatever software. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, when it's on ZIF, it's uh, it, it disappears for for can, some reason. Do you have a pen and paper, Ash? You have a piece of paper and a pen? Yeah, I can write down here. Yeah, just take down my calls. I'll give you my email address. I, I'm just curious. I want to see these pictures. If you can provide me with pictures, and sure. then worst comes to worst, I'll just we'll we'll take it from email into the ticket system, and oh, then we'll definitely type, help you. Type your email address in chat, Mike. Oh yeah, that's even better. Bug the shit out of you. Don't make him write it down. <laughs> Put your money where your mouth is. Oh, I, <laughs> I have no much. problem with helping. There you go. So, um, I, 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 at this point, I just want to amplify what John said earlier about the uh, support the video catalog and the YouTube channel. There are literally hundreds of videos and app notes that all of us have put together that handle just about every aspect of using SDR Uno and using it with other third-party software like uh, WSJTX is very popular for FT8, stuff like that. Uh, several just on pan adapters, which we did discuss. Um, you know, if you want to, if you happen to be using Ham Radio Deluxe, you can interface to that. We got app notes on that. Mike has FL done Digi, multi PSK. Yeah, yeah. There's all, all tons. of those things. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you did ACARS stuff as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the AD, there's ADSB, which, you know, standalone ADSB software you can use, uh, satellite decoding for Jero. Uh, what's the other one uh, that my friend Alex did? I can't, Technoid, 
So if you want to do the one, yeah, yeah, if you want to do the marine messages, you know, the emergency action messages that go out over a satellite, if the pirates are attacking a ship, you get those messages. Um, I know John showed a, a slide earlier. I think it was your uh, SDR Uno introductory slide where you could see in the main spectrum, there was annotation all over the screen on the various signals. Yeah, I mean, if you want and me to share my is, screen, I can, well, I, was, I can. I, I don't know if that's feasible. What I was just going to say is the plugins, which didn't really get covered very much. There's one called Fran for frequency annotation, and uh, it will pull down databases, uh, SW SCADs or uh, EIBI. And for like shortwave stations, it will identify them on the actual uh, spectrum window for you. Oh, here, here goes Mike. He's gonna, he's gonna give us a demo. So if you guys um, want to see, I mean, Fran, whatever you guys want to see, I can, I could try to show you an Uno. So with Fran, very, very just, briefly, I'd do Fran because you know it's always going to be there, uh, and then perhaps if you get a, if we've got time, you could also uh, bring up DX Cluster. I don't know if anyone on the call here does DX Cluster. So but Fran is limited, I believe, to 196k, but our bandwidth, our span is much greater than that. So as we zoom in, it's going to fix itself. So I know I'm tuned to WWV, which is 15 megahertz, and it's going to show me WWV. If I go down to 10, it's going to annotate with 10, or whatever it thinks that broadcast might be at this specific time UTC. So as I'm going up and down the band, here's a transmission. It's going to tell me that's possibly, uh, I know it's not L. It's not an L transmission. So it's either WWCR, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, or it's something else. But it, Fran will annotate. Uh, multiple file format. So if you wanted to annotate your own file, an S1B file, we can go ahead and do that also. Uh, speaking of frequency files, I have tons of banks. If you go to SDR Play Ham Guides, all of these banks that you see here are free. You can download any of these you want and use them. I maintain them. Uh, Fran is phenomenal. What else would you like me to show, Steve? That how about DX cluster? Uh, again, I okay. don't know if anyone's using it. So we'll go into it, this but, plugin. Yeah. We'll, we'll unload this and we'll load up the DX cluster. Just give me one minute. I'll put my call sign in. G, and we will start the cluster. And here the status, the cluster is running and we're waiting on a count. And what that's going to show is how many spots it's found within the DX cluster network. So I'm, I'm not tuned to anywhere in the amateur radio portion. There's only one. So let's go down. Let's see if we can find it. All right, now it's two. There it is. So it just spotted that station on 20 meters. And it's telling me that there's, uh, it looks like Victor Echo 2 something. I don't have my glasses on, but it's telling me that that station has been spotted. And now I have a chance, if I had a rig, that I could possibly work that station. If I was to add a spot from DX, uh, let's say, Log for OM, Ham Radio Deluxe, that spot is going to show on the cluster network and then annotate on the screen. So yeah, as I spots don't know come... one knows what, what DX clusters are, but... Uh... It's a network of, of... It's almost like we're sitting in a group. There's 80 of us here, and I say, hey, guys, there's a rare station on 14225. Hop on. But let's say if I'm not around to tell you, the cluster network is going to tell you because it was other people that were saying, hey, guys, there's a station on 14225. Check it out. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And this, you know, compared to Fran, which is was standard broadcast stations, mm -hmm. this is individual hands that are, are, are transmitting it. Again. This is real time. This is live in real time. Yeah. yeah. And you can set then you can set how long you want the annotation to persist for. So. Obviously, if it's getting very crowded, you can yep. reduce that. And obviously, if it, if you leave it there for a long time, the station may have gone away. But if it's you know if you set it for five or ten minutes, it's chances are the station's still there. It's, it's like a dwell time. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be registered for a DX cluster. You just have to be a, a, a licensed ham because you're putting your call sign into there. It's this way it allows you to log into the cluster network. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you. You can use SWL if you're not a ham and you're an SWL. You can go online, get a free SWL call sign, which is for RX only, and place that in the cluster. No, that's fine. I'm a registered ham. I just yeah, yeah. never used DX cluster before. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's you, worth playing with the plugins. They're, they're very diverse. Um, there's, uh, well, I can actually show you, there's there's one there that's just just designed to. Talk to this uh, contour shuttle uh, tuning wheel thing that I've got, which is very 
you know, low cost way of having a tuning dial for, for setting your rig. And um, yeah, you can see it there, uh, Mike's pulled it up, which is, which is kind of cool. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of good stuff. The, uh, the people at Black Cat Systems make some nice software. They've got DX Toolbox, they got an SSTV decoder, Weatherfax plugin, and uh, you have to pay for their software, don't get me wrong, but it easily interfaces to Uno using that Black Cat Systems uh, plugin that's there. Here's their EQ. So if you want to EQ the station for those that are hearing impaired, I use this specifically for, for weak signals because it allows me to, to shape the sound. I'm, I'm raising the volume of certain frequencies, raising and lowering those frequencies. And if I can cut the bass, raise the treble and the highs, I got a better chance of hearing a weak station, at least for me. Some people are hearing impaired and they just need another option to allow them to, to shape that sound. I just, so, I just saw the other one that I always gloss over, Mike, because it doesn't apply to you and me, but it, it would be good for Mr. Hudson would be the DAB one, because uh, a lot of those guys on this call, if they're, if they're in Kent or wherever, at least in the UK or Europe, mm -hmm. Uh, they have the ability to uh, tune into DAB stations, which is awesome. Unfortunately, not in France, because this is DAB+. Plus. Yeah, we do DAB+, plus as well. You can download... Uh, oh, it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh, can decode yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Oh, that's new. Let, let me just... Um, yes, please. Let me stop well, sharing. Well, I don't know if John... Um, John did mention, you know, if you bought an RSP1 when that first came out, we didn't even offer any software. But since then, SDR Uno has come along and has been offered to everybody. We've constantly upgraded it. We've added the scanning function, the plugins we're talking about right now. And that functionality has been added to anyone that owns an original RSP1 yeah. or, or they bought a 1A years ago. So um, what we've done is you, you've not had to invest any more money in hardware. You've not had to invest any more money at all because the, the, the software is constantly being updated free of charge. And uh, it's fantastic to my mind that you get all those extra capabilities that you didn't used to have. And uh, now you can do it even on the oldest model of the RSP. So I've just posted the link there for the DAB yes. video sorry. guide, but there's links there or you can go direct to uh, yeah, sorry. to the help and, and get it. But so, uh, yeah. It's, and also the ADSB plugin is working fantastically well. Oh, the yeah. A, isn't that awesome? It used it to be is. Close oh, Uno and open up Dump 1090 separately. Now it's built right into SDR Uno, yeah. and, and you can start picking up those aircraft. Yeah, well, you can do you it click, with all three. Yeah, as use... soon as you click on, on, on start, you see planes. I mean, okay? yeah, nothing to do. You can use our plugin, which is going to show the information. You can pipe that data out through beast mode and have it go into uh, ADSB server, and you can have them all running at the same time. I usually run three maps at the same time. Yeah. There's a question from Ian, whether the cluster for the DX answer. cluster, did you answer that? I didn't hear. Yep. Oh, okay. What, what was the answer? I the answer it. is yes. Okay. It will show, it will show uh, uh, parks on the air. It will show soda activations. It will show anything that's mostly those clusters. Like if there's a big contest or if there's somebody doing a, a you know, parks on the air, a lighthouse event. I think you guys have lighthouse events. Those will definitely yeah. show up on the cluster. A hundred percent they will. Yeah, cool. um, I've got a question, and I hope yes. it's not a stupid question. Um, I know I arrived late, and I do apologise if it's a stupid question. When are you going to do one that transmits? No plans at the moment. Oh. It, uh, um, it's it's quite a big leap to get into that, um, purely because obviously there's a lot more sort of regulatory issues around transmissions, and sure. also. Uh, you know, country by country, and it's something that the big boys are kind of geared up to and to some degree addressing. Uh, it's something we're often asked, though, so it's not a stupid question, okay. Jonathan. It's, it's in fact, every time someone mentions it, you know, it notches the, the, the thought, why don't we, we do something? Is, you know, our receive range is one kilohertz to two gigahertz, so you want to add a transmitter that runs over the same range? And I see someone mention Dave mentioned Hack RF. It's kind of a special purpose box for Hack RF. And um, you know, if if you want a really nice transceiver based on SDR techniques, there's a company just down the road from me in Austin, Texas, called Flex that makes really nice SDR based transceivers. 
with a really nice price tag as well. And um, one thing I wanted to, I was thinking when John presented earlier, he was showing, you know, looking at the entire spectrum. And what you're doing with a receiver where you want to look at a broad spectrum is almost exactly the opposite of what you do in a conventional radio. In a conventional radio, a super heterodyne radio, what you're trying to do is you're, you've got IF stages and everything because you want to narrow the bandwidth as much mm -hmm. as possible, but you only want to care about the, the frequency you're transmitting and receiving on. Whereas what we want to do is we want to look at a wide band so we can see everything, which of course leaves us wide open to mixing products and God knows what else, which is why we have the secret source in the, in the diagram uh, John showed earlier on with that bank of pre-select filters where what we've done is, I mean, that was the, the difference between the old RSP1 and the RSP2 and what we have now. We put much better pre-select filters in to give us the ideal uh, combination of a, a wide bandwidth to look at without getting spurious products in there that, that weren't what they appeared to be. And, and so when you've got something that, that does that, it makes it very hard to say, well, let's transmit as well. What frequencies do you want us to transmit on? you know, and, and correspondingly, what power levels do we want to do it at? It makes it tough. I think and there's a, oh, sorry. Stan. I, I was going to yeah. just wrap this up and say, and there are other companies uh, called like ICOM and Yesu and Kenwood, and I already mentioned Flex, that build very good transceivers. And, you know, to be honest, uh, a little company of seven employees like us, we're not really going to compete with those guys. But what we have found is we have found a, a market niche where instead of concentrating on building a very good transceiver, we are, we are able to offer a, a unique um, receiver that can integrate well with existing transceivers. And I'm not saying we won't ever go ahead and, and do a, a, a transceiver, but it, it really doesn't fit that well with what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, John, yeah. You're, no, you're, all I was going to say is that you know, as well as that question, Jonathan, um, there's also the question, you know, when are we going to go above two gigahertz? And someone mentioned the hack RF, of course. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of fun to be had. But again, it's low, uh, low, low range communications at 2.4 gigs. And, and, and it would be great to, to do more up there, and particularly with the spectrum analyzer and all the other good stuff. Again, it's we are where we are partly historically from the Merrick's relationship. Um, actually, a lot of people, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about combining our receiver with a transceiver for all the extra uh, capability that you get with it. Other people, uh, because of the higher performance of our receiver versus a hack RF, um, there are people under two gigahertz using a hack RF for some sort of transmit and using a RSP for the receive path. Um, you know, it's uh, it's kind of horses for courses and the, you know, both the hack RF and the RSPs are cheap enough that that can still be an economic uh, combination for whatever you're trying to do. But um, it's it's great to, to, to have that encouragement. Hey, SDR play, why don't you go and do this other stuff? And uh, we do, <laughs> you know, we do take note, but no, no plans at the moment on transfer. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, good evening, my fellows. Tarek speaking. Hi, Tarek. Oh, yes, I can see. Yeah. Uh, uh, are you hearing me? Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the lecture. It's very good. Uh, I tried the, my, uh, my one is uh, RSP1. Uh, two years ago, uh, trying to receive, uh, you know, Qatar Oscar 100. I already installed the dish and the LNB with the T bias and uh, installed the Ono, you know, software on my computer. It's an old one, Dell old one, but it's Windows Seven. And uh, you know, I I heard the voice, but it's not intelligible, you know, uh, for uh, for the for from the satellite from the bird. But other than that, all the all the audios from other any stations, any station are very intelligible. I I don't know why, because I I you know uh, tweeted. So this could tweeted. be the Doppler problem, I would think, uh, Mike, isn't it? 
the, I don't know if it's if the other ones are intelligible and this one isn't. Um, I'd like to. Could you do you know how to perform an IQ recording in STR Uno? Could you give me a short clip and send me an email with that clip? So this way I can play it back here and I'll try to demodulate it here or, or emulate the issue that you're having. Okay, I will try. I will try to do some. If, if you're not uh, familiar with, but, if you're but, not familiar with how to making an IQ file, just email me and I'll walk you through that part too. Okay. Okay. I see we had another question from Ash on uh, satellite downlinks and uplinks. Um, it's a definite maybe. Um, At those frequencies, the separation is like that. So as long as there, you have, you're a half wavelength, no, Steve? Well, not, it's not, not just that. It's also, it's very directional. So Yeah, and it's very low power. Yeah, the amount of signal that would come yeah. out of the transmitter bleed over into your receive dish or, or what have you should be very small. And... Um, the, the, the way to do that would be to experiment a little bit, especially if you have control over your uplink uh, transmitter. Power. Yeah. And, and look at it in, uh, in UNO and see what the signal level is because the RF spectrum is calibrated in dBm. It's not just a relative dB scale or dBFS or anything like that. It's, it's referenced to one milliwatt, which is zero dBm. So as long as you don't see any signals that are getting close to zero dBm, you, you have no problem. And um, I don't know, Mike, if you want to do your magic again, I did. I'm already on it. It's all done. I, I did a video on near field uh, coupling. And although it wasn't talking about satellite uplink and downlink, the principles are the same. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as long as you limit the continuous power arriving at the antenna input of the RSP to less than one milliwatt, you're good. And uh, in your particular case, Ash, I don't think you'll have any issues whatsoever. I don't either, because the separation is this, it's yeah. directional, and it's low power. Yeah. I, I, yes, I, I, yes, I tried. And, and I, think, uh, I think it was a very good signal. You know, I think yeah. it was a very good signal. Mm -hmm. yeah, enough to, to hear, the, to, to hear the, the audio. But, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I, I am on lower side band and the audio on uh, upper, but it's not, you know, something like this. I thought Oscar 100 both upper side band. It's, it's uh, using upper side band, yes. But he's saying the effect is such that you cannot that is, resolve okay. the sound. And I wondered if that's a Doppler issue, but... Um, Wouldn't it shift if it was Doppler? Is it? Wouldn't you see the shift in the main SP? You'd be able to chase it around, you mean, and yeah. resolve it yeah. if it was purely yeah, I, Doppler, yes, so it can't. Yeah, okay. I did, yeah. Yeah, I did. I checked everything, you know. Well, if, if, try, try doing what Mike said. If you can make a recording of it and send it to him, he'll he'll check it out for you. Yeah, I'd love to. I, actually, yeah, you sparked my curiosity, so I, I definitely would like to see it. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Uh, just a quick one for me. I'm uh, about to leave the meeting, but uh, John, I'm uh, Canterbury born and bred. And, oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I knew Professor Jenkins quite well. He's oh, yes. Here. <laughs> I, I have his book here. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he well, was uh, obviously part of you your hear about people in Zoom meetings not wearing uh, trousers. I, I <laughs> hope not. <laughs> there you go. Oh yeah, yeah. There he is. Well, he, he was, was a, uh, he was a real character. He um he created what was known as the Jenison erection, which <laughs> was on the the electronics building up yeah. on the Kent University campus. Yeah. Um, he yeah. actually managed to get the planners to put this giant tripod. Well. Qu yeah. uh, with a with a focal point and it was supposed yeah. to be the focal point for a radio astronomy dish which they ran out of money and then i think the planners got worried about snow on it but that did not deter him he built his own parabolic reflector out of dexian and chicken wire he then <laughs> took hold of a of a radio controlled helicopter and we're talking long before dsps could control a a, a helicopter and um, and tried to to measure the um, polar pattern of his his antenna. It was a fantastic uh, disaster, but um, <laughs> a lot of people had a lot of fun and I think learned stuff along the way. He was oh yes, yeah. I, I remember the uh, 
uh, as you say, the erection on the roof, because eventually uh, uh, we put a, um, uh, a station in there. Well, it was the, uh, the local, uh, um, uh, you know, the uh, goodness, uh, Nigel helped me here. <laughs> Nigel uh, is ex yeah. um, uh, UKC. Yeah, UK. that's yeah. right. We're, we're running a packet node uh, station the packet from there. Yeah. and did so for quite a few years and that was providing the uh, link between Europe up to Marshallsham and down on the south coast for the oh. DX cluster that was my interest so wow there Gosh. we go it's a small world good stuff Very, yeah and I'm, I'm pre-semiconductor uh, my license goes back to 1958 and I'm 82 now so wow. you can see how I'm going to duck out I think I'm going to make it some rest <laughs> So good evening to you all. I've enjoyed the meeting very much. Learned an awful lot of uh, thank you. You owe here, and uh, I should be uh, using it a lot more than I do at the present time. Well, that's great. And of course, Kent University inspired me to well, keep up with electronics all these years. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. So yeah, go. that is it. <laughs> well, thanks, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, good Peter. Bye, bye, Pete. See you later, Peter. Yeah. Speak to you tomorrow. Yeah, uh, Peter. Okay, any more questions? I've got just one curiosity more than anything. Uh, firstly, I, I, I realise that um, confining myself to being somewhat of a novice um, and not been playing about with it too for very long, I, I've got a lot more reading to do and um, I can check out a lot more of the resources that you've mentioned this evening. But one thing I did notice that I'm just curious about, and that is that um, I'm using the um, uh, 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 set up as a pan adapter with a 7300. When I switch to CW, on the 7300, it automatically switches the 7300 to CWR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that something that I should expect to happen? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's the any file on OmniRig. Absolutely. Got it in okay. one. Okay, I was just curious about that. Uh, and uh, I'll sort that for you, Jeff. That's not a problem. I'll get a file right. across to you tonight. That's fine. Thank I can do that. Oh, look. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's, that's Jonathan and Emily's new new edition, new family <laughs> edition. Come and say hello. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's a good example there of the community at work. And um, those, those groups that John mentioned, um, you know, contrary to what you guys may think, although you probably aren't thinking it having seen us for the past hour. We don't know absolutely everything about how to use our, our radios in every situation. And um, w when I go out and I give a similar talk to, to the one John gave tonight, I often show all sorts of applications, beautiful weather satellite images and stuff. And it's like all this stuff came from the user community. It didn't come from SDR play. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we attempted to build a wide range receiver and then our users went off and did the most incredibly wonderful things with it. And, and everybody has their own interests. And you pick any given subject, you go to one of those groups and the, some guy can help you out on it because he's been there and done that. Like you've been there and edited that any file for the 7300, which many people have had to do. So uh, that's, that's the strength of the community. And it, it, I think it's wonderful. I, I just love watching it go by, you know. Thank you very much. That's answered that question. That's great. Um, and I've got another one, actually, just a, a, another curiosity. Only one, mate. Sorry. Only one. <laughs> just a, just go a ahead, quickie. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I, I've not got into actually programming uh, the memories in SDR at the moment, SDR Uno. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible? I mean, I, I've, I've obviously got a memory bank in the uh, 7300. Mm-hmm. Is it possible to select the memory function in the 7300 and have those map across to uh, uh, SDR Uno? Or does one have to create uh, a separate bank of memories within SDR Uno and then sort of basically navigate from there? I think, I think the answer to that without, and Mike might be able to give me more information or, or another 7300 user might have that. Um, I don't know if you can, you know, export the memory uh, locations from the 7300 to somewhere else. 
in which yeah. case you could edit it in Excel and then dump it down as a as a uh, memory bank file into Uno would be one way of doing it. I think that's probably the, the easiest. The other oh. way would be just to step through the, the memory locations in the um, ICOM. And each time you hit a new location, hit store, store it. Yep. memory yes. bank into Uno. So that's the way I would do it. Yes, yeah. that's, that's what I was thinking of doing. Yeah, uh, I, thought do I, I thought I'd just ask the question because basically the interaction between STR Uno and the 7300 is in is in VFO mode, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the, I don't believe there are any commands that OmniRig understands that could be used to try and select a memory location directly from the icon. Yeah, yeah. Um, one how more. Many, how many memories have you got? You got a lot? No, not that many at the moment. Okay, um, just, just bring. I can I can transpose them quite the easily. Store. Yeah. Once I've sorted out the uh, the new memory banks, etc., which I haven't a attempted to do as yet, I'm still very much the novice. Um, There's a video on it for you. Yes. <laughs> is yeah, it a I'm, handful I'm, of? I'm memories? looking at them. <laughs> how how many memories would you say it is? It's like 10, 15? Oh, it's probably about um, 20, 25. All right, send me a list. I can make you a bank in, a ha in less than 10 minutes. Yep. And I'll save you a ton of time. You're still going to watch the videos because we want you to learn. Yes. But... <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's the thing. I, I, I'm progressively going through things as I find them. And I'm, I'm happy. I'll make fun. you half. I'll make the first half. And then you continue on with the last half of that list. So okay, I'll, get you, I'll get you started. Okay, Mike. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, do you know what, Mike? While you're here, <laughs> I'm gonna. <laughs> while you're here, what I what I'd like to do is get you get you uh, to join us one evening, and kind of just talk us through, um, you know, like a bit of a workshop we'll on how you do all this stuff on okay. Uno, because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would really be beneficial and we can record it put it on youtube for you know if anybody else wants to watch it at a later date but okay. if there's like a group of us and just do it as a workshop to actually talk us through these things because once we understand how to do it and we know yeah, how yeah. to do it we can then develop yeah, our own, own yeah yeah, we, yeah. We, we can do that and then share that with others at the club sure um, well my strong points are hf from from dc to 30. uh i can do stuff i can show you stuff with Marset. Uh, yeah, that'll be I, great. I mean, I'm, I don't do much UHF, VHF, I'll be honest. No, so I anything don't. from 30 and below, are, I'm, those are my strong points. Anything in, okay. in L-band, I'm, I'm pretty confident and capable, cool. even ADS-B. Uh, so if you guys have a list, if it's like, when is the uh, Mac OS version coming out? I don't know. I can't help you with that. But I can yeah. certainly help you with Uno. I'll be more oh, than happy to. Great. Okay, we'll get if, something if you, to uh, if Did you we mention to... that Mike's got a bunch of uh, of memory banks yeah. already available? Yeah, on I'm gonna. Download. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be doing that, Steve. I've I've got uh, as I said earlier, going from the seventy three hundred to the seventy six ten was a big leap for me. I sold the seventy three hundred, and mm -hmm. they had the board fitted. And I did forget that I've actually got a, a 1708 SDR, the B. I've got that version sitting here, the MFJ. I've got mm -hmm. that before I had the board I was using that. So I've really, really missed it. I mean, uh, on the CQWW uh, uh, 2021, I was seventh, seventh in England um, in the contest. And that was because I was absolutely hammering it through using, yeah. you know, every tool I could in the arsenal. And, uh, and I don't know why I just didn't think about getting it out before the, <laughs> the talk. And then it dawned on me, I've got the, the duo sitting here. So that's going to be fired up again tomorrow. And, uh, and I'll get all the banks and that and start watching the YouTube videos. So because you're, no, you're is, is, is a good one for you. Yeah, go on. Duo. Yeah. Let me let me just you can use the built-in tr circuitry in the 7610 like i described earlier yes yeah in and you can use that mfj switch on another antenna input yeah with the duo so that you can have a separate receive antenna separate going receive. Yeah. Be protected when you transmit yeah and there yeah. is a note called diversity tuning pan adapter or something that i did yeah diagrams if you need that. yeah i'll i'll, I'll uh, give it a watch so you've you're, got all the you're... bits and pieces you need 
As soon as it comes out, your voice is going to be the Barry White of the shack. You know that, don't you? With <laughs> YouTube videos. <laughs> Andy, can you can you query a list of questions that, that your yes. club might have? So this way, at least I can I, will. A little, I mean, I can answer questions yeah. you know, off the top of my head, but just of to course. really yeah. you know, try to give them the best answer I possibly could. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'll do that. I will do okay. that, Mike. I'll get something together over the next week. No rush. And then just I'll, give me a day's notice and I'll... You. Perfect. Yeah, just, yeah, just give me great. a couple of days notice. Like this time yeah. is the best time for me. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's good for us. Okay. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Okay, that's great. I'm going to ask another question. Um, and it's a, in some ways, I suppose uh, it's, it's another kind of product question. Have you considered an SDR hat for the Raspberry Pi? Uh, for receive? For yeah it's it's you could already tether it 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 will yeah it's i'm not sure about the performance mike do you know I, well no i mean because you're going off the, the gpio pins i mean you would have to tap off the usb bus you would have to tap off it's a good question uh, yeah. i certainly haven't but I... I understand what you're saying so almost like a pie hat like what they do at all star there you go okay I don't have an answer for you. So I mean, the wheels are turning. On the internet, <laughs> look on the internet. Somebody like Pi Maroni, for example. Right, right. Oh, no, I'm very familiar with those things. I, I do you know, a lot of development with Circuit Python. There you go. So there are thousands of hats that all mm -hmm. do different things, and I think an SDR Play branded um, SDR hat for the Raspberry Pi would sell like hotcakes. If you could find the Pi, <laughs> if you can get your hands on a Pi. Yeah, I, I've got several. If you're stuck, uh, I can help you out there. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been looking for a Pi 4. for, for my, Actually, I can give you guys a link. It might help you guys. Okay. Uh, let me just pull it up. I've got, I think, 15 in a cupboard at work. <laughs> Here, I'll post a link in chat. Uh, you guys might like this. Well, I'm glad you're not saying it's a silly idea anyway. No, 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 because I, it's 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 the you have the the, the bus, the 40 pin bus right there. You have the GPIO. I don't know if those GPIO pins break out to USB, but I know that there's USB pads on the four. Right. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's also the question what 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 you'd actually use it for and whether we could you know get enough performance um and then it would be the, the software limitations because then it? it would be the, the software john because then you would have custom software i don't know i don't i don't know the limited there are i don't know what the the, the limitations might be yeah certainly certainly we're we're you know we're starting to do more with the raspberry pi generally and looking at um well i might as well plug my raspberry pi video. but hmm. i haven't you know we can um take a look at that hmm. okay thank you I'm actually very interested, John, in, in lifting one of these 15 you've got sitting in your work cupboard. What? <laughs> Jonathan, that's oh, the... <laughs> that's a bit of a that's a bit of a thing. I want one. Next time I see you, I'll bring one. Perfect, thank you. Anybody else have any questions, comments, criticisms? No. Well, I would just I would just like to start off by saying thanks very much, uh, guys, and and to Andy and the other employees for an absolutely fantastic product. Um, I can. It's just I, I, I'm quite excited about where it's going to go in the future because you know since since I first saw the uh, the RSP one, it, it's really developed and the software. I mean, even in the short time that I've I've not used it. I mean, the plugins are awesome, just from what mm -hmm. I've seen tonight. Um, I had seen the DS Cluster one before, um, but they're they're fantastic. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite exciting. Looking well, we hope hope to keep going again. It's sessions like this that give us the buzz to yeah. go on. I know Andy, he was so be so sorry not to be here because he just yeah loves the feedback yeah. and it drives him on because he's. He's the one who all through the night is sitting there grappling with the, uh, some of the technical issues yeah. and it really does keep him going. So yeah. you know, there's Andy, we've got Ian, the hardware guy, they're, they're the, 
lifeblood really of the company yeah. and uh, us three are the I was going to say, I'm, you know, one of the hangers on really, but just so it's just such a great, uh, a great thing that we, we're doing here and having, having uh, this, this community. So yeah, we'll be seeing Andy and, on, um, on March the 13th. He's, he's going to, he's coming Carol down putting on the Hamzilla. The Hamzilla. Yeah. yeah. The Hamzilla. Yeah. So that'll be quite good. Yeah. And obviously that's a great opportunity for anybody to get hands on and, 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 you know, and Andy's uh, yeah. more than helpful, and he, and he, you know, you can try it on the day and and uh, sort of bench test it to your heart's content, so to speak. So yeah, it's quite good. Yeah. And I, I need to just oh, sorry. I was just going to do a, my thanks to Mike and Steve for joining me at such short notice to uh, help out with the questions. It's been great. Thanks, guys. We, yeah, enjoy, it was nice, we, yeah. we all like the feedback because, uh, you know, I, I was just doing hamcation in Florida last weekend. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's fantastic when people come by and, and, you know, they tell you what they're doing with the stuff and everything. And yeah, um, it, it is I always get nervous. Boost. People come up, they say, you know, I came by your booth here last year. At, uh, I bought one of your radios. And, and you're thinking, oh, my God, it didn't work or something like that. And it's like, <laughs> no, I just want to let you know that it's the best thing I've ever purchased, you know, and it, it's great. And the number of complaints we get are very small, which is good. Mm. And uh, it, it's our opportunity to, you know, listen to you guys and find out what you want us to do. Um, none of you guys asked stupid questions today. You said you thought it might be, but none of the questions were stupid. I, I just hope that some of our answers won't. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I've noted over the last week or so is before I was using the uh, S, uh, SDR uh, uh, Uno, I was tuning into frequencies on the 7300 on the HF bands and then obviously starting up the SDR Uno and then starting to play with it. Um, the difference that it can make to a signal from the 7300 is unbelievable mm -hmm. how it can actually bring it up mm -hmm. and you can filter out the noise and, and it is truly a lovely piece of equipment to have and you know if you weigh up the advantages and, uh, and of having something like that in the shack weigh that against the the price that you pay if you were to buy a, a, a transceiver, let's say that would do or if there is one that would do the same sort of thing you'd be paying thousands of pounds for it so well done, guys. It's 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 certainly uh, um, made a big difference here. Thank you very much. That's nice to hear. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm part I'm part of a group in France. You know, and we're talking on a, on a Facebook uh, when we are on SDR play, but all the other SDR unit also. <laughs> and you know, I try to convince everyone to use SDR Uno and not other things if they are on Windows. Because I know there is a learning curve. It's quite complicated mm -hmm. for them for some time because lots of video are in English. And, you know, French people in English. You know. And Claude, of course, did a fantastic <laughs> job to translate the whole manual into French. Yeah, it's, 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 it's is incredible. unbelievable work. Lucky, yeah, I have yeah. to say. But yeah, it's really difficult to convince people to use SDR you know, for some reason. But as soon as they get it, mm -hmm. they, they stick on it. Meaning <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great product. I don't speak French, but if I can help, you know, members of that community or the, the French radio community, I can speak slow. I can't speak French, but I can speak a lot slower and I can try to show them the ropes. I, I'm, I'm, if, if I can do it, trust me, you guys can definitely do it. Yeah, Mike, you know what, you know, I, I saw you once in a while making a comments on that group. Uh, uh -huh. I believe so. And yeah, but if you want me to help you, I'm more willing to do that. Sure. I mean, if they want a yeah. video or if there's a radio club that needs a video and I'll speak, it'd be like NATO. I'll speak and you translate and then you translate the <laughs> questions to me. Why not? I, I'd be more than happy to. I, I'm I'm like an ambassador of SDR Uno. It's the, I use other software, but I live in SDR Uno. They're just, it is so versatile and so powerful. And it, it's, it might look scary when you first load it up. If you look at John's background, all the panels, oh my God, what do I do? It's not like that at all. Not one bit. You just need to see the frequency, raise your gain, and yeah. how to tune up and down and change the modes. If you want to get more advanced, save that for another night. Mm -hmm. Take yeah. it in small steps. Yeah. Yeah. The I think, people uh, one, of, one of the things that I've found as a new user to be uh, a little 
uh, um, difficult at times has been depending which modes that you select in the main window or the RX window, other items actually pop up. Um, and then they're, they're not necessarily always there until you select another function. Um, the IF mode, I think, is, is perhaps one that does that, um, depending whether you select um, zero or uh, low. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll find that in that window, you will get other options that crop for, up at that for time. The, for that, uh, if, if you look just above John's head, are the band select buttons in the RX control window. And if you use those, it will intelligently select and whether to use low IF or zero IF. It will frame the spectrum for just that band of interest. Yep. It will uh, pick whether it's upper sideband or lower sideband that's normally in use. And, and it will take care of all that for you. Hit, hit the band button there, Mike. So no, the, the one there. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, start. Yeah. So yeah, it already we... set the mode as Steve mentioned. It already framed the band and gave me the correct span. Yeah. It, it, it automatically gave me the correct sample rate. It does everything automatically. And when I'm done, I just unselect the button. If I wanna go to 80, you'll see that the sample rate has changed, the span has changed, and now I'm in lower sideband. If I go to 20, yeah. it put me right back into upper. Now just, just deselect that band for just a second, Mike, and you'll notice in the main window up in the upper left, the decimation box has reappeared. That's because right. Now you could adjust that manually. And if you click on the, on the uh, IF mode button to go away from LIF to, to zero IF, there we go. Now you get the choice of sample rate. So now you're like in full manual mode. Yes. But you don't have to do that. If you're uncomfortable with it, like I say, use those band select buttons Stick and it takes buttons. all yeah. that stuff for you. Now, in addition, uh, if Mike can go back to 20 meters, yeah, you're, you're already there. You'll see that not only did it pick upper sideband, it picked four filter numbers underneath that that are applicable to that particular band from 1800 yes. to 3000 Hertz. And if you look to the left of the frequency display in RX control, it picked a step size of 500 hertz. And that's how far it will move when you use the scroll wheel on the mouse, although you can manually override it. Um, if you went to like a much higher frequency band, that step size would correspondingly increase. And it, it takes care of all that for you. So you don't have to worry about it. And Mike's favorite window you see there, the EX mm. control window just to the right, Yes. What I tell everybody is close that window and don't no. open it. You absolutely. Because <laughs> Mike uses it to do all sorts of complicated and fancy things. Whereas I'm a simple user. I don't need any of that crap. Get rid of it. It's just complication. Yeah. You know, so it, it's very much a case of, of use it, um, you know, how you want to use it. And yeah. I, I keep it simple. I use the band select buttons because I don't know how wide each band is. And, and it takes care of everything for me. So all I have to do is like Mike mentioned, put the RF gain all the way up to the top and, uh, and just click on signals, I see. That's all I need. So, you know, and, and if you do go around and start pressing buttons and clicking on stuff and you get lost, there's always that just hit reset. the option button and do reset to factory defaults. Oh, the trick is to make notes first. <laughs> <laughs> if you stick to the main, if, if, you, if you make custom layouts, the workspace, uh, if I share again, and I don't know if there's, if we're short for time, tell me if I'm whopping about too much, also let me know. You can, if you want to arrange your workspace, that's fine. I say stick to the default workspace. So if we just go ahead and we'll just run a reset real quick, we'll reset it to default settings. Okay, I'll launch SDR Uno. It's going to wind up on this screen and I'll just shift it over. All right. I don't have to do anything else. I just go to here. I go to layout default, and that's exactly where I need to be. I just tell it, pick my memory banks back. And I have my own specific settings that I like uh, because of my own, the way I like it, but you're basically yeah, off to the races. The EXW windows gone. I like yeah. that a lot better. Yeah. Uh, no, it's beyond I, I you. Did, it's... The problem there is that as a, as a, a new user, right. you you're have to aware remember, that you've, got all, you've got all these windows there. Yep. And you don't want to necessarily stick to that basic layout because there may be something going on in one of the other windows that you need to learn about. And that's why I've set my, my screen up 
a little it's, differently. Yeah. I, I, I've got more or less everything that I can get on it, so I can see what's going on, and it's pr proved quite advantageous to me. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I see what you're saying, and, and once I get to know a little bit more about it, then I can perhaps condense things down a little more. You can apply what you learn to, to the functions here. It's just yeah. learning yeah. what those functions are. Yeah. Yeah, this is the most complaint uh, we can see is that this multiple window, I cannot get mm -hmm. it with it. I don't understand how it works, blah, blah, blah. When close you it out. Explain if, you don't, if, yeah. this, if this confuses you, yeah. close it out, slide that over. Yeah. I don't like spaces or gaps, so I would close that out. I don't need the. I don't need this here. I'm going to close that out. Yeah, exactly. I'll bring that up yeah. to here, and then and you I'm save the workspace. And save exactly. my workspace. Exactly. It's, uh, but it's knowing that you can do that. Yeah. But also yet, keep in mind that the documents are there, the videos are there. It's mm. it's you know they launch yep. people launch it and they say doesn't work, doesn't work. Yeah. Just take two seconds. I've spent thousands of hours on the manual. Steve has spent hundreds of hours in videos, John videos, myself videos. It's all there. It's all for the taking and it's all free. It's yeah. just a matter of, do you want to take five minutes and just glance through it? Yeah. I agree Thank you very you. much. Okay. So you've, you've done it. Wait, wait, why do you've got it up, Mike? You've, you've done a reset. So this is how it starts off. If you hit play at this point, mm -hmm. okay. You'll get a spectrum right away. Uh, you haven't got the gain all the way up, but, um, and you should start seeing signals. All you got to do is don't don't change it manually. Hit a band button. Be, hit AM broadcast band or something. You know. Well, there you go. You got HF, and it's there. You haven't had to adjust anything. Yeah. No. Yeah. All, all well, I, I'm going to gonna get an overload in medium wave. If you guys see an overload, yeah. that's normal. Just just back off the gain, and that overload condition will will go. I could just click on things, and I'm already at the right filter width. If uh, Right here is just showing the passband, but if I want to see outside of the passband included, I, I have to click F. That's just the way I like it. Some people don't. If you want to see outside of it, it will show as you expand it. I like to have it show the passband, show everything in the offset page. But the key There's thing certain... here is you just did a complete reset and you were oh, back yeah. to signals in just two a, seconds. A couple of clicks, you know? Yeah. It's it's normally when people for whatever reason get frustrated and they start opening up windows and adjusting mm -hmm. stuff, and that's when it gets complicated. Yeah, it's I reset daily. It's it's I'm just used to doing it that way because I, I have to test so many different you know setup can you know scenarios. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's still sharing, and I don't know how to close this. So still just bear with me. It is or it isn't. At the top, no, is it stop sharing. sharing. We don't have Uno showing. It must be on your other screen. Okay. No, I'm trying to stop sharing here in the in the meeting, but it's, it's not. at the top somewhere. Oh, the there middle. we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's it. Now we got John back. I think I, I think I preferred your desktop, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> right, guys, I'm very aware of the time and how much time we've taken with you. We've had two hours, 15 minutes with you guys. And uh, so I'll I'll just start to wrap it off by saying thank you very much. Yes, um, it's very yeah, much agree. appreciated. It's been a fantastic evening. Mike, I will take you up on your offer of a workshop. I most Perfect. definitely will get a, a list of, of questions and queries. Mm -hmm. And it might pay to actually do uh, two, one of them being as a complete new uh, user. I prefer uh, those. Uh, yeah, because there are, I, I know of at least four people at Dover Club that have all gone and purchased rsp duos andy i'll sit with one person if, I, if it's for, yeah. if, if it's for me to just... help a user and it's a customer because they, yeah. they purchased our unit yeah even if it's just hey mike i only got one guy that's okay with me yeah no i don't need 20 fine. people no, i'll, no, I'll no, do no. a one-on-one -on -one. i'll sort i'll sort out a list there'll be more than one yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they buy the product they buy the product and then they're just not very computer aware or know how to set it up or to mm -hmm. use it etc so yeah we're gonna we're gonna we'll get that together I will, I will definitely be in touch mike i'll be happy to hopefully i'll be able to make it to the to the ham fest that's coming up in september john what's the uh, newark so newark is, yeah 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 as yeah. long as things cool down and it's cool yeah you know good. i i should be there so and if i am there i'd love to see you guys yeah if yeah, that's yeah. In, you know convenient for you guys to get there yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Well, well, I'll be there too this I'll year. Be there. I haven't been for a long time. So, hmm. I, yeah. I guess the other thing you can do, if you set up the workshop with Mike, uh, yeah. If you've got a, set, a system local there, I don't know if you're going to be all there in one place or, or 
whether it's going to be Zoom again, but um, be Zoom. we'll off, we'll often use Team Viewer to log into a system remotely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll we'll make sure that every user has Team Viewer ready to go. Yeah, just yeah. in case they need a bit of guidance. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can do that. Yeah, you're quite welcome to log into my system. You can see it running behind me. Yeah, um, okay, no, no problem at all. I'll get something. I'll get something together, Mike, and we'll we'll take it from there. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Okay, doke. That's great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having you. me. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye so every bye. Bye. evening. Thank you. Have a good bye, night. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Yeah. bye. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Andy, for that file. If you're still there, yeah, I'm still here, mate. Yeah, that's yes, fine. I can Everybody's see you, just yeah. signing off. Everybody's going. That's that's cool. Yeah. So, I just want Peter to, uh, PKH. I just want you to hold fire one second, Peter, before you go, mate. <coughs> so, everybody else will just sign out. Jeff, uh, obviously, yeah. you know, as the usual ones can stay. One second. Let's uh very interesting talk this evening, Andy. Yeah, it was yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Right. Brilliant. Hold on one moment. I'm just one second. Sorry, bear with me, guys. And one more. Hold on. Let me stop this recording. <laughs>